Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived entirely to let me spend more time with interesting people than I would ever get on the radio show. And this week's guest, Chris McCausland, stand-up comedian and latterly actor. Well, we've got quite a lot to get through, Chris. Yeah, in, well, in, thanks for having us, first of all. It's a pleasure to see you. Um, we'll, end, we'll end with the end. We'll end with, with the new tour that, that you're um, currently sort of honing and, and we'll take on the road in January. But we'll begin at the beginning. Um, it's a clue, I think. Most people will probably have established the fact that you're a Liverpudlian. I, I, it's a, it's a, my accent is very um, soft compared to what it was maybe 25 years ago. Consciously. Um, uh, well, I moved, to, I moved down to London in 96 and I'm I'm still I'm still where I moved. Um, so, uh, 27 years down south, and um, a considerable amount of that time shopping in Waitrose, you know, <laughs> becoming becoming posher and posher. Um, I like to think shopping in Waitrose with me as the bags, but you know, <laughs> just uh, <laughs> everyone else does it the other way around, swapping it up, downgrading your shopping. Yeah, yeah. West Derby, Wait, is it? Is it, Dar- would it? Would I pronounce it Derby? West West Derby. It West, is still West, Derby. West Derby in Liverpool. Um, which is, um, I believe, older than Liverpool itself uh, as an area, and Liverpool kind of grew around it. Um, but um, yeah, born and bred there. My family are still there, um, and I, um, you know, was um, uh, being, um, you know, a pain on the streets of Liverpool um, right through my childhood, really, because that's that's all you did. That's well, you described you did, really. it as a as a very normal childhood. So you're, you're you're five years younger than me. So it means knocking on people's doors, ask, asking if they're coming out to play, and then Absolutely, staying out yeah. there until tea time. Really. Absolutely, knocking on knocking on strangers' door and asking if they want their car washing. You know, and um... <laughs> we didn't do much of that where I grew up. Chris. <laughs> like, <laughs> we had people to wash our cars. Oh my god! No, we didn't really. But, um, out of the house after breakfast don't come back until your mum shouts you yeah, in the street for your yeah, tea yeah it was um you know it was it was a good um a, a, a good time to be a kid you know when um yes, when you, was, you, you're it? just out on the street um being creative playing football football was it was the you know the the the, the, the life of, of everybody in liverpool in the 80s and um but also you know just you, you know you'd spend you'd spend a day just playing in an entry mm. just making things out of people's junk that they <laughs> that they thrown out um getting into trouble around the neighborhoods you know and, and back then you kind of knew all the neighbors you know because it was you were just out on the street all the time and and you compare that now to like raising a child now and their their life is almost um you know orchestrated by you you know yes. it's planned by you they do things that you take them to that you arrange for them mm. and um mm. so when i say you know it was a good time to be a kid it it it, it was in terms of that that level of uh, freedom and independence i suppose have you got brothers and sisters yeah i got a, got a sister my sister's seven years younger than me oh okay um just uh just the two of us it took it took me woman that's seven seven years to get over the trauma of um <laughs> dealing, dealing with me <laughs> <laughs> Um, we'll get on to school next, but first, Google suggests that you might be the world's only professional blind comedian. I've got no idea whether that's true or not, but but your condition is hereditary. So would would your mum and dad have known that you were likely to get retinitis pigmentosa? Was it guaranteed, or, or, or was was there fingers crossed, or was it in the lap of the gods? It's a it's a fifty fifty thing. So anyone that's familiar with genetics, there's um, there's dominant and recessive forms of hereditary. Uh, conditions so like cystic fibrosis would be recessive you can you can carry the gene but not have the symptoms and you can pass it on without knowing you've even carried the gene whereas dominant if you've got the gene you've got the symptoms Um, and so you only need to pick it up off the the one parent that has it if if you know what I mean so my mum it was in my mum's line and so it's 50 50 really so every time you are um, you know every time somebody who's got RP they call it um, it uh, has a kid it's 50 50 so you know 50 50 from my mum for both me and my sister and we both got it um and 50 50 for my daughter and she hasn't got it how do you so, find out they do a genetic test could they do that when you were a kid do, do you know it's, it's mad that they, they still don't even know what the gene is so um i've done i've been part of this 100k genome project where they map out the entire human genome in, yeah. with regard to all all forms of um you know illness disease uh, whatever it is you know genetic conditions and um got it back th- i got the all clear <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you yeah. want to go for a recount? Yeah, I think you're you imagining it, Chris. <laughs> 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 so that's like a pip so, assessment. Yeah, it's a little bit like um, you know, it's a little bit. It feels a little bit like you know, the, the, you know, the you know, you read a book like the the, the police trying to identify a um, a mobile phone signal, and r- rather than being able to go, oh, yeah, it came from this house here. They can go, well, we think it was in the south, the, the south London area. Um, they kind of know the rough Gosh. area where they think the uh, the genetic coding error might be but they, okay. they couldn't tell you where they so they can't test it for it um so the only way they can test it at the minute is to um do the old i suppose analog tests where they you know show you things and um see how your eyes react and they can do these little electrical tests where they monitor the the level of signal from the eye to the okay. brain and but it's all very analog compared to just testing the the, the genes so good grief yeah my daughter's passed all of that um, how did that make you feel when we found out she didn't have it yeah oh i mean it was emotional you know because yeah. it, it it's um it it means that not only has she not got it but she can't pass it on of course so because as i said if you've got it you've got it yeah. uh, there's no recessive nature to this so um if she hasn't got it she can't pass it on so it's it's kind of dead within that that line of the tree that now is, yeah, that is so it's it's um yeah it, it's one of those things where um you know you make the most of the situation you've got in terms of like you know i do for for, for me of course but it's not something you wish on um you, you know well i manage so why should do you know what i mean it, yeah. you, you you know if you could change it you change it um so um absolutely you know d- delighted obviously but very emotional when when, when did your mum and dad first talk to you about it how, how did it sort of how did you, know you become what? aware of what the future would hold or might hold I can't remember any conversation that was, um, you know, almost like, listen, this is what might happen because mm. me nan was blind. So um, it was always, me nan was blind, two of my uncles were blind. So I grew up with blindness in the family and my mum had it. She wasn't blind then, but she, she, you know, her eyesight wasn't great. Right. Um, and so it was always just something that was around and okay. and joked about and dealt with. <laughs> um, and then I suppose my first kind of memories of it with regard to me were going for eye tests because as I said, I, I mean, we're talking about my daughter having tests, um, you know, five years ago maybe, but like me having tests in the early 80s um, was a lot more primitive than even electrical tests, I suppose, you know, just literally waving pictures in front of your face. So what can you like see? What can you, what can you make out? Yeah, so I've, I've got a lot of memories of having, going through those those tests and, um, and them even putting glasses on me at one point to mm. go, well, maybe this will help, even though it's the retina at the back of the eye and glasses uh, to correct lens issues. And so it, it felt... I suppose very primitive, um, even just back then. But they're, 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 I suppose, my first memories of. I, yeah, I didn't. Of it. I didn't realise it was still such sort of, you know, that the science was still so primitive, really, still in such early stages on 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 this specific condition. So you knew. So we'll get to primary school now. Did you you you, you knew you were never going to play for Liverpool, but not because of a lack of football talent. I mean, that's what I'd like to think. Yeah, you know, it's um, <laughs> when you when you're growing up in Liverpool in the eighties, it's it's Liverpool and Everton and mm. Liverpool and Everton in, in the most wonderful of um, integrated ways. You know, through families, through streets. Yes. My best mate's an Everton fan. Um, you know, I've known him since I was three, and um, and there's a. You know, I suppose now there's a, a biggest, uh, there's a bigger, you know, uh, such a, a big gulf between Liverpool and Everton. But back in the 80s, it, it, you know, it, football, you know, Liverpool and Everton ruled the roost. Yes. Um, and it was a, a brilliant time to be one or the other. Um, and um, who doesn't want to play for their local team? That's that's what you that's what you want to do. I wanted to play football or I wanted to play snooker. I was, I loved the snooker as well. Um you know, and um, you know, watching John Parrott win yeah, the, the world championships yeah. as well, um, both of which rely on impeccable eyesight. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you picked him. <laughs> um, what was what were you like at school? What was primary school like? Where, where did you go? Was it a Catholic one? I, I just, no, Church you know, of England. Church so of England. Um, yeah, in St Mary's Church of England school, right in the centre of um, West Derby Village, um, and it was. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I was, I wasn't a good kid in school. I was um, as in behaviour and discipline. Yeah, I was disruptive. But I, in I, a nice way, or were you, a, were you a little shit? I was, I, I, I was a little shit in terms <laughs> of, um, 
you know, I was I was disruptive. I was um, I, I was restless. I, yes. I never sat still. Um, I, um, you know, I, I, I my, my school reports were, um, you know, something <laughs> something to be. Um, you know, looked back at in later life with a with a comedy lens, if yes. you know, through a comedy lens, really. But at the time, were um, the source of much anguish and, and many uh, many many um, serious conversations. But mum and dad, <laughs> mum, 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 <laughs> many, many talking tos. Oh, they, mum and dad they, were worried, were they? I mean, they? They they never they never enjoyed. They never turned up at these parents' evenings thinking, "Oh, good, we get to find out how well Chris is doing this year." It was like, <laughs> "Oh, what are we going to get told this time?" Um, and I was. Yeah, so it, it it wasn't something that was, um, I, you know, I, I took too massively. Right. But but I suppose I had the brain for it. So my reports were always has the potential. Yeah. However, yeah. and I think part of it as well, you know, was um, you know my eyesight was decent but yes. not good enough. Okay. And so I couldn't even see the blackboard. So I could see to get around. I could see to play. Um, I could see the textbooks if they were under my nose, but I couldn't see what was written on the blackboard. And I suppose when you are even at that age, slightly removed from what everybody else is, when you haven't got that stimulus, that, mm. that you, you are kind of entertaining yourself in other ways. Yes, no, of course you are. <laughs> and I sense that you would have bulked at special treatment, even though it might have been quite useful for you at that stage. Yeah, so well, right right the way through, um, you know, you, 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 you have this desire to be normal yes, whatever normal is yeah all kids and i remember you know uh, you know there were occasions within that first um within that first what would it have been kind of uh, four or five years of school where i did have like a, an assistant hmm. that would come in to sit with me during certain classes and i still remember now that feeling of deep embarrassment oh. about having somebody sat next to me right um that when everybody else didn't and it's 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 mad really that like when you because th- i remember back at that age being with these kids from year one and none of them treated me any different sure. even, even though you've got even though you might have a, a you know things in larger print or you might have somebody coming in to sit with you in the class none of these kids treated me any different because they'd grown up with me and i do remember um maybe when we were about eight years old this other kid just joining the school mm. and he had something wrong with his eyesight but he had these big thick bottle bottle lens glasses and and they they mocked him and mm. they and i was and it i suppose because he was the new kid yes. and different and even then i remember thinking why do, why why they, they they've never done that to me but i suppose you you look back now you know and you go well it's because they you know i I suppose from my point of view, losing your eyesight very, very gradually, it's like the frog in the water. You don't yeah. notice the changes. Sure. And when you are um, joining school when you're four and your eyesight is, is you're kind of, there's less you need to cope with as well when you're four years old. This there's a true. lot more, you know yeah. what I mean? And, <laughs> and, and so the kids around me probably don't notice the slight differences happening that I don't notice happening in terms of struggling to see the blackboard and right. you know what I mean yeah, so th- they it's are incremental. yeah absolutely yeah so um but I do remember that being a being a thing you know did what did it did it I mean did it upset you when the other lads started getting bullied or teased it must have done yeah, because I still, still remember, remember it, it now with, with, with and and when you're that age when you're young it's a lot of the a lot of the memories that you have are of trauma and or bad things yes. and, and not even trauma from a what we would consider to be trauma but just things that obviously um uh, caused distress or stress to, to a even with just a moderate degree they they kind of stay burned in your mind like i i still remember um i still remember one school assembly um where we we had to we had to stand up and say something that we'd got that year, mm-hmm. and my teacher said, "Well, as I mentioned, they, they were trying everything on me. Stick some glasses on him." Mm. And she said, "Well, you should say about your new glasses." And I, I and, and she said, "But I think you should say spectacles. It sounds more, you know, whatever the word was, you know." <laughs> yeah. And I, I and I remember doing this thing and standing up in the class and saying, "I got this year, I got some new spectacles," and all the other kids laughed, <laughs> right? And 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 I, I was, but they didn't laugh with me. They laughed. 
at me yeah. with what I'd said, and I remember being so upset about that. And um, and they happened to apologise to me for making me do that and misjudging the oh, the room. Really? And it, yeah, it was because I was so distraught that all of these course. kids had laughed at me about this thing. Oh. And it's mad. It's that, shame, like, isn't it? Even though there was nothing to be ashamed of, that burning sense yeah. of shame stays with you. And I suppose saying it in such a weird way, I, I got some new spectacle. <laughs> you know, it's. it's <laughs> And, um, and the irony is, you know, obviously tr scarred as a child from a room full of people <laughs> laughing at me to now desiring a room full of people to laugh at me. <laughs> hey, we got early on the amateur psychology. The, um, so, but that teacher sounds quite pr protective of, or, or not even protective, but quite nurturing and interested in you. So even though you were a, a disruptive little fella... The yeah. teachers wouldn't look back on you. They, they they wouldn't look back on you with like an, uh, uh, eye rolls and 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 annoyance. They'd probably look back and remember you quite fondly, would they? Um, do you know what? I like I I I would I, w I would I would hope so. Yeah. In terms of you know from from my experience of being the kid, sure. I know how disruptive I was. But from their experience of being the teacher, they used to disruptive kids. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I was um, I was a bit of a pain. Uh, and were you a clown? Were, were, were you a class oh, yeah. clown? You yeah, were yeah, trying yeah. to make everyone laugh even yeah. then. Yeah. And I were mean, you good it, at it's it? it's written in my school reports on uh, quite a number of occasions. Thinks he's the class clown. No good will ever come of <laughs> and this. And you've already had that line. They're not <laughs> laughing with him. They're laughing at him. Yeah. They, that, the teachers always love to say that, even when it's not true. In fact, I think they get even angrier when they are laughing with you, and they have to say they're not laughing with you. They're laughing at you. Yeah. Um, but you, I mean, what you'd have been. Because uh, like it's a bit stereotypical to imagine that everyone in Liverpool is funny, but but it, it, you know banter or whatever you want to call it badinage, it's very much part of the fabric of the city. Absolutely. So even by the standards of Scousers, you were a funny lad. Um, so it's it, I I I think well comedy certainly ran through my family in terms of the way we dealt with the eyesight, you right. know, in in terms of um, laughing at it and laughing at your 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 situation rather than dwelling on it, mm. um, and. I, I would say that as a kid, I was probably trying to make people laugh. Um, whereas, you know, you, you fast forward quite a number of years to me starting stand up. Yes. And my mates would say, what makes you think you can do that? You're not funny in the pub. <laughs> so it's it's all perspective, isn't it? You know, it I look is. back and think, oh, yeah, I was really funny. But... <laughs> I was born for this. I was born. Um, do you remember making the grown ups laugh? Do you remember making your mum and dad laugh or, or your yeah, uncle? Or... Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because we all made each other laugh. Right. Yeah, it, it was very much, um, I, I, I think, um, very much, as you said, part of that era, part of that time, especially in Liverpool. Um, you know, a lot of. Um, you know, Liverpool it was a city that was, um, you know, wore its heart on its sleeve yes. and had a lot to deal with in the 80s. And right, and I yeah. think, um, you know, it, it, it's one of those... Survival. Things. Yeah, yeah. And, and when you are existing on the street day to day as, I mean, just play, as you said, you, you have your breakfast, you come back for tea. Mm. Um, and you are interacting with all these characters, all of these, all of these, you know, all, all these fellas coming out of that house, and, and mm. you know, engaging with you. You are getting it from every everybody. It's not just the, the the people that your family interacts with, you know. Yes, of course. Um, so yeah, big part of growing up in Liverpool. Now, if the, if this was a script, then there would be an inspirational teacher who intervenes about now. So you move from primary school to secondary school, who managed to find a way to to lead out your obvious intelligence and and translate it into academic achievement but but I read that you managed to get an F in GCSE French so I'm thinking if it did happen it wasn't a French teacher that did it no so my my um so my, my I didn't know it went down to F Chris do you know what I, and I should have got a U or an N but I turned up with a beret on um <laughs> So, <laughs> I, I genuinely 100% spoke my French oral exam English with a French accent. Sensational. Um, I, I, the, the weather, a woman today. Um, I, I, I was terrible at it. I had no interest in it. Um, and my French teacher was also my RE teacher, and they were my two worst subjects. Oh, so, she, she, I mean, I would say she was my worst teacher, but purely. Uh, from the basis that she her job was to try and teach me the two things that I didn't care about the most 
Um, That's grim. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So French, I got an F. I just wasn't interested. She tried to arrange uh, a, a, one of these things where we exchange things where I went to France and I said I didn't want to go. Yeah. Um, and then in RE, she genuinely would encourage me to put my head on the desk and have a nap because <laughs> it was easier to have my unconscious. <laughs> did you like anything? Did you enjoy? Did you enjoy any? So did you have favourite subjects that you were good at? So I, I enjoyed. You know, I enjoyed history. I engaged with my history teacher. He was a lovely man and it was stories and it was interesting okay. and um, um, I could I, you know I, I, geography and stuff I, I didn't really I, measuring rocks I mean how, how exciting can you make that um, <laughs> but it was I suppose when we got uh, maths yeah. I was always very good at maths okay. I always loved maths I found it it was a challenge it was a game um, and then as I got older and we um, had more exposure to computers. It became computers and maths. They were the two things, really. So if I'd met you around GCSE times and I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? What would you have said? Um, so around about GCSE times, it would have been, you know, working with in computers, really. Already. Programmer, developer, something like that. Um, yeah. And did you have one at home? Did you have a Spectrum or a, a Vic? Yeah, or? so, me, I mean, we got, my first computer we got was the Sinclair ZX Spectrum Plus. Yeah. With the with the external tape deck and the proper keyboard, uh, little, yeah, yeah, you yeah. You got the plus. The little key, every letter had a word written on it as yeah, well. Yeah, but you didn't have the rubber keyboard with the plus one. You had the no, proper, key proper hey, keyboard. Proper keyboard with the um, get you with the and you'd 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 have all these games that yeah. you because they were all obviously just analog screeches that mm. that pro, you know that the computer interpreted, um, and you'd record them onto blank tapes, yeah. and you'd have like fifteen games on a on a on a tape and you'd you'd spend 10 minutes waiting for it to load and it loads and you go ah oh, it's the wrong game <laughs> <laughs> happy days though happy days you yeah. spend hours lost in those games yeah. you look at them now and they're unbelievably primitive but you'd already developed enough enthusiasm and talent to think that that was something you could do as a, as a career well it was it was the problem solving aspect of it I think as well you know in terms of maths I, I enjoyed the problem solving aspect of it and then in when it came to programming um, later in life, it was it, it was pro it was problems. You had to try and use the tools that you were given to make something happen that you didn't know how to make happen, or that you yeah. know you wasn't aware of how how it could be done. You had to try and solve that puzzle, build something. You know. So you did that at A level, did you? Maths and computers. I, I did and maths stuff. and further maths and computers at A level. Yeah. So you were you've given a slightly misleading impression. Then you were. By, by this stage a bit of a boffin really so I was I was I was good at the things I wanted to be good at I but think. very good y yeah I mean to an extent so like you know I mean you hear things you hear stories now don't you about you know oh I'm doing I did 15 GCSEs yeah, and course. 5 A levels and I got A stars all the way I wasn't yeah. one of them kids I, no. I got I got an A in computers and I got an A in maths and then everything else was uh, was was you know uh, maybe a B and and then C's and D's, you and know, it was run of the mill. An F for French and an F in French, yeah. <laughs> um, but 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 it would have been reasonably, it would have been an expectation of you then to go to university as you did. Was that? Would you were you the first in your family to go to university? Um, certainly the yeah the first in, in my immediate family. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and did it mean a lot to your parents? I mean, did they, was, was education a big thing at home? Not particularly, no. no. no I mean, it, it it was in terms of, um, it was in terms of try your best and have an education and um, and open have your options open to you. But there was no um, there was no pressure in terms of you must go to university right. and you must, you know what I mean? It, it, yeah, it I was do. very much find your own path of what you want to do, and I. Um, I went to so w when I went to s secondary school and through college, I went to so I actually went to a, a secondary school that was specifically for kids with poor eyesight. Right. Um, and because going back then, you know, in 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 the um, late eighties, very late eighties and the nineties, just the ability to make things accessible was just a different world to what it is now. Yeah. Um, so I was in a school uh, w that was like that, it, doing these GCSEs, when I. When I got to do me A levels, I had such a desire to just live a normal life and right. be normal. This word normal, mm. you know. Um, I went to college in Liverpool, um, and I, I was there. For, I, 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 six weeks, I think, I've got in my head, um, and they just couldn't teach me in terms of the, they had no methods, no ability to to 
get the information that they were displaying on a board at the front of the room Into and, your and head. It, oh yeah, yeah. And, it, and they just said in the end they said we can't and that that was like 94 right um, Crikey. yeah 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 so you know it's it's just mad isn't it really that uh, you know what technology and obligations and, yes. and things have, have have changed in the last 30 years um but i ended up going to a college again for people uh, kids uh, you know kids right. young adults whatever with um, with eyesight problems um, and that was in hereford so i spent um, so you left home at I left point. home pretty much when I was 17 even though you go back for you know the main holidays right. and some of the half terms but um, but yeah I kind of hit that what you would say is the uni experience Quite early. Um, a little bit earlier and um, caused havoc around the, 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 the small town of Hereford so you took to city it. of Hereford even there's a lot of cider in Hereford you uh, took to it did you? you you didn't sort of miss home unduly or um the independence yeah i took to the 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 i i enjoyed the independence of it you know mm. yeah and I'd, i you know i you know went went home uh whenever possible and um you know me as i said my best mate from when i was you know when when we were little tiny kids yeah who's you know the everton fan uh <laughs> me and him we would um we go out underage underage drinking in, in <laughs> Liverpool Town Centre to a to a club called the Crazy House with a K. That's how crazy yeah. it was. Great. Um and um because we we were we were very much into the whole American um, grunge scene of okay. the early nineties. I think you did Pearl Jam on Celebrity Mastermind. I didn't did, you? yeah. yeah. There you go. There's an indicator of Isn't my lack it? of academia. <laughs> no, <laughs> <it's> just, <laughs> um, let, let's pause just there at college, and just because you'd already developed a passion for stand-up at this point, but but solely as a consumer, I think it was largely through VHS videos. I think wasn't it? Yeah. So I I loved stand up loved comedy all my favorite things were, were were music and comedy except music except comedy predates the the music right um you know i the, the first video i just i got bought me mum and dad bought me rowan atkinson live mm. on vhs probably about 1990 1991 somewhere around there um which and one was that was it the one when he does satan Yep. And yeah, goes, the, the sermon. Yeah, yeah. And, and lawyers, and, and, lawyers. And, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and the, and the first iteration of Mr. Bean, I think maybe as yeah, well, was I on it. And right, yes. Angus Deaton was 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 there playing there. Was, some of the he parts playing the straight it. man almost? Um, and and I think they probably bought me that because of Blackadder. Right. Um, and that I, I just loved it. And um, from then on. Uh, videos every Christmas I, I had a list of these new videos that were coming out from Lee Evans and Jack D to mm. um, pr pretty much you know everybody Alan Davis and all, all of these um, all, all of these comedians that were just the top of their game through the 90s you know yes. and you watch comedy and you're only seeing the best of it you know you're only seeing these proper top end comedians so it's never something that you ever think in your head. I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. But it was something I loved consuming, and, and, um, I suppose, um, you know, I'm just away from stand up. You know, Frasier, um, Bottom, yeah. uh, Red Dwarf was my was my, my main uh, favorite show. Um, just yeah. absolutely adored everything about it, um, and. I suppose then 1996 maybe yeah I bought an Eddie Izzard video be a definite article would it it would have been yeah, yeah. and it was in I bought it in Woolworths gosh um I bought it entirely based on the cover I'd never heard of him right um and um I I the, the cover Eddie was on the front yeah. dressed quite flamboyantly I could still see at that point uh, to, to make out what was on the cover and and the cover was textured he had like this fairy top that yes. you could feel on the cover and and I kind of thought I knew what it would be in my head. Oh, this is going to be, he's going to be doing quite um, camp uh, comedy, maybe like Julian Clary, something yeah. like that. But I loved stand-up, loved all stand-up, and I just bought it and took it home, and it absolutely knocked the socks off me. Uh, <laughs> it, it, because there was nothing like it. It, 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 it the surreal just, flights of fancy absolutely that... because it, it it took everything I thought it was going to be and just smashed it over the head 
and it, there was nothing like it. It was like a new type of comedy was, that I'd yes. never seen. Um, and and I love being proven wrong in terms of things like that. When you judge something, yeah. you know, and then it's just the it's just nothing like that. And it was it was it was imaginative. It was genius. It was it was it, oh, it just absolutely blew my mind. But they were in that chair there where you are not long ago, and and I, I completely agree with you. A similar experience at a similar time, but I never. Did you never even in your heart of hearts harbour the idea of doing it yourself one day at this point? It's the sort of 96. No, no. So as I, as I said, it, it's one of those things that you um, you look at because you've only got exposure to... The uh, finished. The, the, it's like to, only uh, yeah. knowing about Rolls Royces, so thinking I'm never going to have a car, isn't it, really? Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. And you think that must be a great job. Yeah. But it's like, you know, it is. It's like It's like looking at Mick Jagger. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you then, can't you can't look at Mick Jagger and go, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, No, you're right. I mean you've just gone through really a who's who of the most accomplished yeah. comics of, of that era. And and back and unless you're going to comedy clubs, which you can't really I mean, they weren't prolifer proliferating then either, were they? You're not you're not gonna see people earning their spurs, learn it learning their craft. So yeah. And, and even then, I mean, because I probably started going to the comedy store around that time, right? right? About around '96 when I moved down to London. Yeah. Um. So probably after I'd got that Eddie Izzard video, and I started going to the comedy store, and there is a level below what you see on the telly, yes. but it's it's not a it's not a level below in terms of quality. No. It's it's still. You know, it, it's t it, the the glamour and the glitz of TV and these massive theatres being taken away, but it's still ma people who are massively top of their game. Yeah. And it, it, so you still don't come at that, that going, yeah, I'll just do that. Yeah. So, because, <laughs> but, but some comics do. I mean, we've had quite a few on full disclosure. You've mentioned Eddie, but um, Ed Byrne, he started while he was at college, kind of. Yeah. Um, Jack Whitehall did it when he was basically in the sixth form, but but. You, you you just felt that, I, that it's not I can't it's not for me it's not yeah well I, I suppose I mean well you didn't I, even think that it just you didn't even entertain the possibility so J Jack's I mean with, with regard to Jack doing it when he was younger uh, it's different because his exposure to stand up has been so different to what mine would have been in the nineties with social true. social media yes and you know in university you know, there's there's the student comedy competitions and yeah. you know it, it's a different kettle of fish yeah. Ed uh, Ed Byrne I I saw his show um entirely based i mean th this just goes to show the difference back then in terms of exposure but his one bit that he did um about alanis morissette isn't it ironic and he lists the things in that song that aren't ironic <laughs> that as a bit went so huge yeah. that he was famous Technically, off one bit of stand up, yeah. and and he had he had he had enough to back it up. Yeah. But I went to watch him live at the. Um, I've got a feeling it was somewhere called the Talk of London or something like that. Yeah, um, on Tottenham Court Road, was it? No, it might have been. Yeah. yeah, and I went to watch him doing a show there, entirely based off that one, one clip. Um, and he he was he was stunning, yeah. you know. Um, but now it feels like you have to throw a lot at the wall you're right to, to get that exposure yeah. you know back yeah. you know you, even if you just go back and go well the two ronnie's got 20 million viewers a, a, a year sure and now i you know i get i'm lucky enough to get to do have i got news for you and would i lie to you and you have to do so many more of those shows to 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 get into even half the homes yeah that one episode no, that's a really <laughs> yeah no it's a really good point it's a really good point. So after you, you say you come to London, that was to go to Kingston. Kingston Uni, yeah. To do software engineering. So you're still on a computing web development tip. But throughout all of this, of course, your eyesight is getting gradually worse and worse. It so, is, yeah. yeah. So I wasn't even going to go to Kingston. I wasn't even going to go to uni. I, when we talk about the inspirational teacher, yes. uh, it was a gentleman called Tim Ashmore uh, when I was doing my A-levels, and he was my maths lecturer. Um, and he was um, he was the math lecturer in in Hereford, and he was such a brilliant teacher mm. and such a brilliant man. And I didn't want to go to Hereford. And I know back then I played it as well. I don't want to get stuck in this academic. Blah, 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 yeah. blah. And I know looking back that I was terrified mm. of of going to this massive place 
that was huge and being and having to navigate that and do that not that, you know going from what was specialist education for the last seven years yes, of course. into that in, environment terrified me um and he he persuaded me to just do the application for right. it and then it's my choice yes. you know yes. and so i i did and i um put kingston down on one of them because a mate of mine it was in the year above went to kingston the year before and he was having fun okay and i put that down and then ultimately i went to kingston entirely because i would know someone there when i got there <laughs> <laughs> there are worse reasons yeah no. you know but that that for me alleviated that just that uh, initial s- entry level angst that there'd be one person that you could talk to yeah and then as it happens you. as it happens uh me me best mate that i've mentioned twice now he he'd, he'd he did college in liverpool and then he applied to um, sunderland university and and I, I he applied he kind of decided after yeah. me um and and then i said oh well i've already accepted a place in kingston he went oh i'll just come there then <laughs> <laughs> and then and then he got he phoned kingston and said can i can i can i apply and like come down they i said come down for an interview and he went down and then he got in so it turned out that me and my best mate ended up rocking up to kingston together oh that's lovely and we both ended up living in kingston you know he lives in Fleet now, but he was in Kingston until probably five years ago. Fantastic. And, um, yeah, so you know the scousers, the scousers came down together, keeping it tight. <laughs> and, and 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 you 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 saw it out. You you graduated in two thousand. I was the only one. I was the only one. Uh, so when you go to uni, you you make this solid group of friends yeah. that is. You know, if anyone if anyone was to ask me, you know, should I go to uni or whatever? For me, that's the main thing. Mm. It is is the experience the social experience and the group of friends that you can make that will be friends for life i suppose um because all of them you know i mean there's about six of us i was the only one that finished really? and they've all got they're all they're all heads of this and heads of that and doing like incredibly well-paid good jobs most of them in it I'm right. the only one that got the degree in computers. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have the. So you did to start with. You 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 went into it. You went into web development. I think at first. Yeah. So that I mean, as After I said, graduation. Pr- programming was really what I enjoyed. And, what sort um, of things did you like? Pro- Is that a silly question? What sort of things did you like? Programming? So I, w- I was very. It was very much web. Um, so I, I was programming in, in well, basic HTML, dynamic HTML, JavaScript, um, and back in the late 90s things were um, very much becoming about you know it's the drag and drop world isn't it and, yeah. and whizzy wig yeah. and you know you are not just designing things based on lines of code but you are designing things based on um, you know making things look pretty on the screen in front yeah. of you and so I, I wasn't as good as, at that and uh, also okay. I um it was taking me ages to work with lines of code right and you know there are people out there that can do this and i've got the patience for it and there are people who, who use braille who can program at quite a speed but you know i never learned braille as a kid because i didn't need it and i didn't yeah. i was resistant to it right um and so i was I, I was getting slower and slower and worse and worse when i should have been getting faster and faster and better and better got it and and so it was one of those things where I just thought I need to do something else. You ran out of road, really. Yeah, I don't want to be worse than the person next no. to me for things that are out of my control. Rather, than, you know, you, I do. You, yeah. yeah, you want everything to be within your control and within your reach. A tricky period now, I think. You, you were essentially unemployed for about eighteen months, were you? Yeah. What was that like? Um, for the two lads I lived with, a nightmare because yeah. I, 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 you know, I was unemployed and. Applying for jobs, right. but like I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I had a mate who ran a pub, and I, I go down there quite a lot, and you know, I was every day was a Saturday and a Sunday, wasn't it? When yeah. you weren't, when you wasn't, uh, I was on benefits, um, but applying for work, applying for jobs, applying uh, for IT jobs, but not programming, right? And yeah. you know, a lot of the jobs, there was just, I suppose, from a from a company point of view. A lack of, um, I suppose, a lack of obligation or desire mm. to um, have the inconvenience of somebody that might need a little bit more um, adjustment. Sure. Um, just going back twenty odd years, yeah. but also, also just a complete lack of accessibility to yeah. Yeah. in-house systems. 
So if you're working for, um, you, you know, if you're going to get a job for an engineering company or whatever, and they've got all these in-house, um, you know, d database-backed systems that you need to be, act you know, interacting with and the, the in-house mail system and none of it's accessible, then how do you, how do you function? Did it get um, you down? Because there must have oh, been a yeah, lot of rejection yeah, yeah. during this period. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, and as I said, I'd spent too much time in the pub. Um, and when you, I, I, I've always thought when you're that age, you, um, you, you know, you're meeting people all the time, you're socializing yes. all the time, and people will ask you, What's your name? Where are you from? What do you do? Mm. And when mm. you didn't have an answer to all three of them things, it, I, it, I, it, I found it deeply, um, embarrassing yeah. to not have the answer to that third one. Um, yeah. and in the end, I, um, you know, as I said, I started applying for loads of stuff, mm. but I, 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 I ended up um, doing some working for a charity, doing voluntary work because I thought, well, you get something. You need to, you need the routine. You need yes. to, you need to create this. Um, so you weren't feckless then. You weren't lazy. You were just unlucky, really, in this period. Um, I suppose. Um, I mean, maybe it was a lack of foresight as well. Oh, you know, okay, yeah. because, because you, you, you I. I I mean, you you are uh, you, there's there's an element of, of of bad luck to it in that you you end up working in something that becomes quite visual. Yes, but also yes. also I knew my eyesight was going, um, and even if it hadn't have been visual, uh, it was still going to be difficult. Right. So I suppose I went into it with a lack of direction. Yeah. You know, um, and and then you know I suppose a little bit of stubbornness in that I'm still wanting to work in IT mm. without really a clue what else I could do right. because that's I'm, I'm a geek you know I'm a, I'm a bit <laughs> of a nerd I'm a, a logical thinker um, and 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 yeah you, you, you just end up falling into this um, this rut um, but as I said you um, you do need to you do need to create a routine and try and create the structure that you wish you had if you know what i mean and yeah. and i suppose working for a charity just getting out the house every day and doing that was um it, it gets your mind back on track doesn't it of course it does uh, yeah and and uh, you, you know keeps things spinning doesn't it yeah, you yeah, yeah. so so you that you did that and then i think there was some work in a call center as well yeah was so the, the call center was you know after i got me uh me structure back yes um, and then you go, okay, well, I've applied for all these jobs in IT um, and, and th this hasn't been working. Um, I need to just get a job. Um, so let's try some call centers right. and, 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 and just start from, you know, the, start from scratch again. Um, and so I, um, yeah, it was a place in Kingston doing business sales, health and safety manuals and right. things like that. Advertising. Really, Advertising. No, no, no. So it selling was the actual manuals. Selling, selling employment law products to, to businesses. Oh, they got um, And again, it was, it was, it was mind numbing, <laughs> but, but a good gang of people. Uh, you know? It always and, makes it, any job in the world is doable, isn't it? If you're working with a good bunch of people. I yeah. Think. Yeah. And, and that then becomes, um, your new world yes, you know of because yes, of course. because you you when you know i'm living with two fellas at this time we've mm. both got jobs and i've got these worlds their own worlds yeah. that, that, that are part of their job yeah um and i don't you know i've just got me mate who runs the pub yeah yeah <laughs> it's lonely and um and 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 so yeah it does give you that new social life that new group of friends that that answer to that third question you know <laughs> um, i do do something yeah so, and, and then we come to this weird bit where you got shingles, you signed off work for a fortnight. <laughs> I'd love to know where you're getting this research from. Is that not true? Yeah, it is true. Yeah, it but is. like I don't think I've mentioned this for like a good ten years it's, or whatever. It's, it's, so. all, it's all Helen, the producer. It's nothing, yeah, it's nothing to she's, do with she's me. She's been on Google page twenty eight, hasn't she's she? She's dug right into it, and and you thought because I, st I I don't know where this comes from, Chris. You thought I'll have a go at stand up, so we know that you loved it, but we know that you'd never really entertained it. Yeah. You just wanted to what? Get the sticker and say I'd had a go, or, or it so wasn't it, like a burning ambition that you were worried would never be fulfilled. It hasn't felt or sounded like that so far. So what it was, I, I had shingles and I was signed off work, mm. and I was just bored, bored at home. Yeah. And on Google, and I'm a massive stand-up fan, so I'm searching for new comedians um, that I don't know, or for some clips of comedians that I love that I haven't seen. Um, 
and on on Google, the things that came up at the top were, um, you know, learn to be a stand-up in 24 hours, learn to be a, <laughs> learn to be a stand-up in seven days, and they were, were they were the first things I saw, and I was like, oh god, you could you could never do that. That'd be amazing, but you could never do that. Right. And I was like, well, do you know what I mean? I'll see if I can write five minutes of something yeah. that I think's funny. I'm bored. I've got nothing to do. Okay. And it, but it was those things that put the idea. It, 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 that question into me head and the, the 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 boredom of sat at home looking through google you know that i thought Just, well i'm gonna see if i can write five minutes and i kind of i sat down and i wrote some some of me on stamp for the first time ever um who did you try it out on no one no one at all until Absolutely. you got until you got to the pub in Ballam. no one go no off. one and then once i'd once i'd written it um i um oh i tell a lie sorry i told i tried it out on nobody in my circle um but once i'd written five minutes i signed up then to this one day comedy course right. um entirely to be able to stand up and do this five minutes right. in front of other people got it that had and i i made sure i signed up to one that was nowhere near where i lived so <laughs> I, w I went all the way down to bristol <laughs> <laughs> and there was there was like you know nine other people or whatever that all wanted and we spent a day kind of talking about comedy and then we stood up and we did our five minutes in front of each other Gosh. um so that was the i suppose that was that um and then i um and i phoned up places at a timeout this, yeah. this has gone i mean even just Crikey. gone back 20 years that's that's how we worked is yeah, getting time out phoning up the places booking in gigs um and um and I, I i i just wanted to give it a go and say i'd done it then now i had this five minutes and just right. and I, as you said the, the bedford in balham new act night on a tuesday um the, there's a, a proper comedy night been running there for so many years called the banana cabaret but course, this was a yeah. new act night on the tuesday um and i did i did five minutes there at the end of july in 2003 um just to just to say that i'd done it really and I was terrified I felt sick in my stomach I had to take the Monday and I was working in the call center I had to take the Monday and the Tuesday off work <laughs> um, just to pace round and and practice this five minutes um, and I um, I went along and it was whew, it was passable like right. I, I got I got I got some laughs there was no expression in my voice there was no there was no looseness there was no yeah. it, you know it was almost i suppose robotic and maybe i'm exaggerating that in my head looking back compared to like how i feel now but sure. you could have pushed me over with a finger i felt so you know faint and malnutritioned i hadn't been able to eat <laughs> solids for two days uh, <laughs> but it was all right it was uh, all right and something's switched inside you something thought I, I, I want to do this just got uh, got enough laughs I got yeah. enough laughs and thought you know what that was alright I'm going to do it again and just see if I can get more laughs mm. and I did it again and then again I remember my second gig was in Soho uh, um, a laughing horse gig which they ran a lot of um, yeah the, the you know the open mic circuit in London back then uh, wonderful to me they were in terms of the amount of gigs that mm. I was able to do through them um, third gig was in um, West Hampstead. It was a free free to enter gig, which um, you know you, you you know can be difficult once you've you've got a you know you, some experience on the circuit. Yeah. But I remember doing that, and I remember Lee Mack was headlining. And even then, doing a third gig with Lee, it was doing the sketch show at the time, um, and having you know somebody headlining that you know off the telly. Yeah. Um, back then, you're like, oh, my, this is this is incredible. Um, and I remember that third ever gig sat next to um, uh, Tom Rigglesworth, yeah. who just started the year before, and I'd heard him on um, possibly uh, the So You Think You're Funny final or, or, or the BBC New Comedy final or mm. something. I'd, heard, I'd, I'd seen him on the, or heard him on something. And getting to talk to him, who'd, who'd, you know, from that open mic position, had achieved you know, uh, so much, if yes. you know what I mean. And you just end up finding this world of people and you found a momentum as well i think yeah yeah it, it, it's it's it, it's a hobby it's not oh but i'm you... going to be a comedian it's yeah, this is that. fun to do these people are great these are these are crazy such a wide diverse group of people most of them nuts you know and and <laughs> yes. and it's it's a social group and it and it's 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 brilliant yeah. but you hadn't realized throughout all those years of being a fan a mega fan that you'd also been a student 
in a way. Yeah, yeah, abso ab ab absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's it's um, people get into stand up for a lot of reasons, and um, you know, actors can get into stand up because they want to create their own work mm -hmm. and open doors that maybe they're not opening as an actor. Um, you know, people can get into stand up because they, there's something about them that they that they're used to being funny about. So. You know, somebody with a disability thinking, well, I'm used to making jokes about my disability mm. or, or my weight or whatever. So I'm going to go out there and, and, and do that. But without that, without that love of stand up being the backbone of it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, whereas for me, it was the love of stand up that, that ultimately in, in and of itself. got me into it. Yeah. What, what, when did you knock the day job on the head then? Because things worked, you know, it, 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 it's not exactly over, an overnight success, which I have seen you occasionally describe that. It's as you've just pinned down it's a it's a 20 year career yeah which has um you know gone into overdrive in 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 the last few years but when did you have the confidence to knock the day job on the head two years which seems you know is really quite quick yeah. for the open mic circuit yeah but 20 years ago um i suppose a lot fewer people doing it than there are now yeah um i was motivated in terms of the number of gigs I did. It was, um, you know, going from not being able to get a job and being employed to working in a call center. The, the the job was, the people were great. The job was, you know, mind numbing. Um, <laughs> and then to find this thing that was exhilarating and you know, adrenaline fuel pumping and and um, and this new group of social social group and this new yeah. hobby. I, I did five nights a week and just hammered it and uh, you know it, it became this thing that I got good at and quite you get quickly. better the more you do the better you get yeah yeah and I didn't I didn't do I didn't do it to talk about being blind no of course so I um, I barely mentioned it and um, I'd maybe do two jokes one at the beginning and I might drop a little joke in somewhere along the way but I you know I wanted to be Eddie Izzard and yeah. not from the point of view of the you know I wasn't doing the oh, you stab him <laughs> I was, but 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 the variety I understand it yeah. was the it was the variety of material and the surprise and and the the, the bashing the preconceptions over the head mm. that I knew that going on stage people would expect mm. it to be all blind jokes mm. like I expected Eddie to be all yeah. all kind of camp yeah. comedy it, 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 and 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 I, I I wanted to do that same thing of not give them that at wow. all, and 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 that's that's what I did. Barely mentioned it, and and I'd, I'd stuff about sharks and giraffes and, yeah. and 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 things like that, <laughs> bomb disposal and all this kind of stuff. And um, looking back, I I I realise looking back that that was my driving force at the time, but also. I think I probably wanted to make myself forget a little bit as well, okay. not just make the audience forget, but also I ah. don't think when you when you're in your twenties, yeah. you're not I, I, and you've lost your sight very very gradually. Um, you are you're a different animal to someone who's lost, who's always been blind, right? And you go through this huge period of denial and resistance mm. and hatred mm. of of the things that define you as a blind person um whether you know whether that's using a white stick all these kinds of things uh, these identifiers you you shun and um and ultimately it makes you quite you know maladjusted <laughs> in yeah. terms no, of sure. and so and so getting into stand up i think looking back the part of it was that as well it was i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to I'm going to challenge these preconceptions, make people forget, but also be 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 normal. It's that normal word yeah. again, isn't it? You yeah. know, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, is there a point? Because I'm conscious that you're very you, you you've got quite clear milestones in your memory. You, you know, you remember the night of your first gig at, yeah. in, 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 at the Bedford in Balham, and you, you're pretty clear on when it yeah. was that the Michael McIntyre thing nearly happened. Is there a point? And I know you never really relax in this line of work because you're always worried the phone's going to stop ringing. But is there a point at which you would have allowed yourself to think you'd really made it? I suppose um, once I realised that the, the stand-up was going to pay yeah. and, and I ditched the job. Even every, that, that early in the game, you'd think, I'm happy with that. No, no, no. no. So, I, I, you know, when, when I'm on the open mic circuit, uh, it's a hobby. 
Yeah. And then once you start getting paid, you start looking at it as, oh, this this could be a job. Yeah. And at that point, I think every goal that I had was was really around the comedy store. Right. Um, because of that, as I said, that's where I went to watch comedy, and and that was the top end of the circuit. Yeah. Um, and so it was about doing an open spot at the store. It was about doing, um, getting a, a, a 20 at the store, getting a weekend at the store, being a regular at the comedy store. Mm. They were all of my first goals. And then to get to that point where I'm doing, you know, um, you know, four, four full weekends of gigs at, at the London Jeez. store and yeah. then at the Manchester store every year. So that's yeah. eight weeks of a year just doing the two biggest best you know most renowned yes. i suppose yes. rather than you know uh, clubs in the country Th that was all of those ambitions achieved you know but then you start going when am i going to get my opportunity <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> well, but it's gravy i see what you so you've yeah. got that bedrock about yeah. i've done that i've built that and, yeah. and 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 now we come to the new show yonks which you're you're kind of fine-tuning at the moment yeah I th i've read that it's gonna it's it's um sillier than uh than the last one so i finished me to i finished my last tour in may and um it was it was meant to start in 2020 and it, you know due to um something happened i can't remember what it was yeah, but. it's a lot of that though with your in your life because i think dara's <laughs> show was called so where were we wasn't it so an awful lot of people had and ed Byrne actually had a big hiatus as yeah, well it's, yeah it's, yeah yeah through th quite a lot of things yeah a lot of stand-up acts into disarray so to, to come out of a tour in may and then to be starting again in january feels yeah. like quite a quick turnaround it, well, but the is. truth of it is is that i did have two years while this one was on hold Right. you know kind of putting stuff together and so i, I haven't come out of this last tour empty-handed um and the last tour was a lot about as i said when i started doing comedy i didn't really talk about being blind mm. and i think as you get older and you get more comfortable i've got more comfortable in my own skin i think a lot of that comes from being a dad um changes your perspective as well yeah you you, you, you become a lot more comfortable in your skin your priorities mm. shift um, and being a dad gave me a lot to talk about that everybody can relate to, mm. but with a, with a, a twist, with a new angle, with yeah. a, a unique perspective. <laughs> yes, you know? an added dimension. Yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> yes. I didn't feel like you know I was just doing blind stuff. I was talking exactly. about stuff that everyone could relate to. Yeah. And so the last talk had a lot of my experiences of being a dad, being a husband, and doing all of that in the dark, really. And 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 it was quite personal. Um, and you know it was very very well received i loved doing it and we it, you know the rooms were full it was a joy and then we've come out of this to the new one and, I, and i've gone right i'm gonna go back to to the roots back to what i got into this for and um me 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 me, me family don't get a look in on this one <laughs> <laughs> so this is um this is stand up um this next one is stand up for for you know I suppose wanting to be Eddie again. Right. Um, yeah. In, in, it's about everything. It's about it's about everything from Shakespeare and turnips to um, <laughs> to AI and um, the future of technology and um, and you know and 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 you know just a big old mishmash of 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 topic to uh, topical not in terms of what's going on in the world now but no. to in top on based on topics what's going on in your mind yeah, yeah, well, yeah. And, and you'll have probably have a d d slightly different audiences as well because you've done so many things recently scared of the dark um, yeah. which was a, a a fascinating show which i think your involvement in elevated it into a an entirely new place your bromance with paul gascoigne um, doing not going out, of course, after going viral with the with the BAFTA stuff with Lee Mack. That that must have been nice. That symmetry of him being the headliner back in the day, and now you yeah. doing that brilliant sketch together at I the mean, BAFTAs. Absolutely, and and, and yeah. of course, wonders of the world I can't yeah. see. You're a busy man. It's it's been it's been such a, a roller coaster this last few years, yeah. and and the stuff with Lee. Um, you know, getting to do so many. I mean, I've done five what I like to use now on the bounce, and then you know, doing that thing at the Baftas, which is on YouTube if people want to Google it. Yeah. Uh, me and Lee at the Baftas, <laughs> um, g going into that, and and for Lee to to be generous enough and brave enough to to go into something with 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 you know because he's he's achieved so much in comedy. Whereas at the time I was 
just starting to achieve things in yeah. terms of TV. Sure. And we both went into this thing that we neither of us knew whether, whether it was funny outside <laughs> of our own heads <laughs> on live TV in front of the entire TV <laughs> audience. Pick an audience. It's, it's a big one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and the entire, the, you know, the whole TV industry is sat in front of you. It's yeah. on live TV. And we've got this thing that we've come up with in our heads that we thought was funny. And then we're, we're about to go on. And I said to Lee, oh, do you want to just knock this on the head and do the, <laughs> and do the nomination? Do it straight. And he, do goes, it straight. he goes, don't you bail on me now. <laughs> and we went out and we did the first line. And it, the, this this bit that's setting up the premise yeah. about Lee having to read my lines off the author cue to me, the premise got a laugh before yeah. we'd done the first joke. And then me, and I thought, Oh, this is gonna be fine. It's gonna be all right. Um, and then Lee asked me to do not going out, and and I have I have seen every episode of not going out. I, I think it's it's one of the funniest so things on the sweet, telly. So good. And I was so tentative about it because, it, it, it you know, first of all, do I want to you know possibly be rubbish in something that's so funny, mm. and also I mean, acting in front of a live audience when you've got to hit your mark and and blah 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 and all these logistical considerations and. Lee was sound. He was like, "No, we'll, we'll this will be fine." We'll. Stick it on a train. And, you know, Got rid of some of those problems. Didn't well, it? the funny thing is, is um, Lee goes to me. This is how he sold it to me. It's fine. We just do scenes, and we'll do the scene. We'll do the scene again. And if you get it wrong, we'll just do the scene again, right? So we came up with this idea, and and Lee and the guy he writes with, and me, we we we. I got a writing credit on it. We wrote the thing together, and by the time we finished, we'd written this thing that, ex- <laughs> that happened in real time and was one scene. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there goes from, the safety net from from oh yeah we'll just do the scene and we'll do it again and then we'll stop and we'll do the scene again we had to run this thing through as a 40 minute play in one go oh, blimey. Um, and, it, blimey. and it, it works really well yeah um, you can get tickets for Yonks at Um you're, you're playing everywhere people and, and no doubt you'll be adding dates starts in January, January uh, next year ends at the Hammersmith Apollo in London and, um, and we are adding dates and more will be added we Liverpool and Manchester have not been added yet but they will be on the way and Scotland and Wales and Ireland and they're all coming so, so keep an eye on the website is, is, is there anything else to tick off um yeah I mean I, I I love doing TV I um you know I've I've loved making my own show I, I'd love to do more of that more of the travel show yeah maybe host something else on the on the telly um and I've I, I just really I enjoy I enjoy the acting as well. Yeah, being part of stand up's quite solitary in terms of all of, everything's yours. Every all the decisions are yours. You write it, you make all the decisions, and you mm. go and do it. Whereas when you when you you know I've done a bit of acting and and you, you're part of a team and you're doing things that you're told to do and it's it's just a nice little. Uh, you know, um, yeah. it, it's a nice world to be part of. So, so you I'd are like available. Do, you are available uh, for oh, acting roles. I'd like, I'd like to be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm quite a niche casting, though, aren't I? I, I suppose know? so. Yeah. It's, um, but you're still a massive fan, aren't you? That's the thing that's really come across in the course of this conversation. Love it. Yeah. I mean, I I have uh, things I love. I love. Uh, I mean, I, lo- I love Liverpool. I love football, obviously, and 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 I love music. And, and I'm a massive vinyl fan. I've got so much vinyl at home and I and I love comedy and I've got so much comedy on vinyl. I've got loads of old comedy oh, on vinyl. Stuff. I've got loads of new comedy on vinyl. I, when when friends do things, I watch the things they do. I watch, you know, it, it's, it, it's, you know, always a student, I suppose people say, but always a fan as well, yeah, you know, yeah. watch it for joy as well as, as well as learning. Chris McCausland, thank you. Cheers for having us. <laughs>